to the latest presentation in the National Telehealth Research Center webinar series. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstration to support and guide the development of your telemedicine telehealth programs. Normally, they are presented on the third Thursday of each month, but due to scheduling, we are a week early. Located throughout the, the country, there are 12 regional telehealth centers and two national telehealth resource centers. Each serve as a focal point for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. A few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted and also your chat box is um, disabled. Please use the Q&A function of Zoom's platform to ask your questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to access today's and past webinars on your um, YouTube channel, on, on the TRC's YouTube channel. That link will be sent out to everyone. Today's webinar is being presented by the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ronald Weinstein, the principal investigator for the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. Dr. Weinstein is the founding director of the Arizona Telemedicine Program. He is also president emeritus of the American Telemedicine Association. Dr. Weinstein has been involved with telemedicine since the 1960s and is known as the father of telepathology. Um, please welcome Dr. Weinstein. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. <clears throat> it's a rare pleasure for me to actually get to talk about my own specialty, uh, telepathology. And uh, a fair amount of telepathology is being done in the United States, but uh, a lot more is being done in other countries, particularly uh, Canada and China. And uh, we'll touch on why those reasons are. But it's very likely that telepathology is going to be a major growth uh, injury. Uh, industry with a very within a very brief period of time. Um, first of all, some disclosures. Uh, you know, this is an academic institution, and we disclose. So uh, I've been involved with um, a number of companies that have uh, produced uh, breakthrough products in telemedicine and and telepathology. Some of which I'm going to talk to today because just because they're the industry leaders. So Karabi International Telemetrics, Apollo Telemedicine, Demetrics, and Ultra Clinics are uh, companies, uh, all of which are related to what we're talking about today. Uh, and, I, and I might say I really have nothing to do with the uh, daily operations of those companies. Uh, they're more involved, and I'm more involved in the um, inventing side, the innovation side. So what is telepathology? Well, as the name indicates, telepathology is rendering a diagnosis by a pathologist uh, at a distance. And um, it actually comes up quite frequently that that's desirable. Let me, let me tell you a few things about uh, pathology first. Pathology is a very small specialty. There are, it's about 3% of the workforce in the United States, the physician workforce. Uh, that's out of uh, 900,000 doctors, so there are roughly uh, 15,000 pathologists. And, uh, uh, and yet, if you look at the whole world, in the whole world, there would be two times that number. So say there are 15,000 pathologists, there are probably 15,000 in the rest of the world. Uh, there are 30 subspecialties within pathology. So it's highly, highly specialized, highly compartmentalized. And uh, over 80% of the specialty pathologists in the world practice in the United States. So the United States practice uh, actually drives toward pathology because of the, the fact that there are some, so few people and yet they have very high levels of specialty expertise. So that becomes a major driver. So anyway, it's diagnosis at a distance. A uh, couple of more terms, what is gross pathology? Gross pathology sounds gross. Um, and uh, the thing is gross is looking at pathology specimens, say a kidney or a heart or a lung without using a microscope. So it's, it, it's what you see when you hold uh, an organ uh, in your hand to just look at it. And that's important because before uh, every case is done by telepathology using microscopy, 
the case actually has to first be grossed in. We have to describe what it looks like, what we receive from the operating room, and that becomes part of the report. And it also uh, it provides the roadmap for us as to where, where we've actually uh, taken the specimen what we've seen. So this is from, from one, of, uh, one of our uh, telepathology networks. This is a, a PA who's up on the Northern Peninsula of Michigan showing a case down to the VA hospital in Milwaukee. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, so that's, that's about 200 miles away. And up on the television screen, there's an eclipse of skin, which is about four and a half centimeters long. And uh, it's about, let me just get my bearings here. Okay, so there's an eclipse of skin, and it's about, as I said, it's about four and a half centimeters long. And uh, so what you're seeing is the, the specimen that's up on the upper peninsula being examined by the pathologist, Dr. Bruce Dunn, who's down in Milwaukee. And he's telling the PA where to take sections for microscopy. So the blue, it would be the perimeter of the lesion, uh, and a lesion in which the question is a cancer or non-cancer. And then each of the orange lines are places where he's instructing the PA to actually take a section. So he's, he's, he's actually directing the uh, sectioning very remotely. So microscopic, it's looking through a microscope. This is actually from the last case. So this would be a case of probably some kind of a nevus in the skin. And, um, oh gosh, okay, got it. And uh, so you can see the surface of the skin in the upper right, and then you can see the, uh, the tumor cells infiltrating into the dermis. And in that particular practice, they do a primary diagnosis on 100% of the cases. That practice got started in, oh, 1995. Now, fast forward 20 years. They've done close to 20,000 cases, 1,000 cases a year, every year. Very, very successful. Now, the reason they can do that is those cases are then, the glass slides, are shipped to Milwaukee and there are overreads every day. And uh, that's how they get around the primary care. And yet, 100% of the time, or almost 100% of the time, the diagnosis is identical. Okay, classification of tele telepathology systems. One of the challenges in telepathology is that there are a number of different ways to do it. Now, all of them are aimed at the same thing looking at a specimen by microscopy. So it's not like radiology where we have CAD scans, we have MRIs, PET scans. This is just a single attempt to replicate what a pathologist can do through the light microscope. And that's both the virtue, but that's also the problem because that's very confusing to, uh, to regulatory groups uh, like the FDA. But let me run through these and it'll give you a fair, fairly good feeling of the technologies and, and interestingly, all of these technologies, uh, probably including the first one, are still, still being used somewhere in the world. So we don't replace one with the other. It turns out we improve it, usually gets implemented in one of the uh, high-end countries, not one of the industrialized countries, but still remains useful in less developed countries. So we mentioned real time just to put a historical perspective on it. So video microscopy, putting a, putting a video camera on a microscope, was really first done by RCA in their research labs in Princeton, New Jersey around 1952. And within five years, video microscopy was very commonly being used in research laboratories, and a whole string of papers came out and continue to come out from those types of research laboratories. So by the time it had first been done for uh, human cases, it was uh, a dozen or more years later, and that was part of the very, very first multi-specialty telemedicine program that was in Boston, linking the Massachusetts General Hospital and the Logan International Airport. So this uh, telemedicine program was set up to take care of the needs of uh, uh, air, airplane passengers in transient, you know, develop something on the plane and needed to be seen by a doctor, but also employees working out at the airport. And uh, the actual program was uh, actually up and operational for, for, for uh, quite a few years. But the television microscopy part of it wasn't called telepathology until 1986. But the television microscopy part of it uh, was done uh, basically taking a video camera, putting it on a regular live microscope, and then using the kinds of specimens that you would see for patients in transient. And basically, you look at blood and uh, sometimes they're gonna look at urine. And uh, so they're basically smears on glass slides. 
Uh, so the case on the left would be, uh, for those of you in the crowd who are doctors, that's a hypochromic microcytic anemia. That's an easy diagnosis. And then on the right, we see a, a, a cylindrical structure that actually is coming out of the kidney from a patient with proteinuria, protein in the urine, and it's actually a cast of that kidney. So that helps us with the diagnosis as well. So that's historical. That's where it all started. Fast forward 20 years. Uh, a number of technologies came into play in the mid 80s, number one, because there were needs, and I'll mention what some of the drivers were. But in addition to the needs, technologies came forward. Static image telepathology uh, was one, it came on, online really exactly at the same time as robotic dynamic telepathology. And static imaging, think about putting a digital camera on the back of a microscope and sending the image by Instagram. Of course, we wouldn't do it that way. Uh, there are tips of regulations, but it's basically taking digital snapshots of specimens and sending them somewhere else. That's widely used in, uh, in, in developing countries. In Africa, that's almost the only technology you would find in the 41 African nations. Uh, uh, is it a good technology? Uh, well, the answer is it's a very good technology. So for example, if you're dealing with a developing country and their diagnostic accuracy uh, for surgical pathology, it's generally gonna be in the low 80s, 83, 84. Uh, you can take that up to almost 95% using static image telepathology. The problem in the United States is we require 97%. So falling 2% short is, uh, keeps, it, keeps the technology uh, out of places. So static image telepathology is taking individual images. And later on, I'm going to talk about whole slide imaging. And all whole slide imaging is a giant static image. And it, may, it, it involves taking multiple static image pictures and then electronically weaving them all together. So we're gonna deal with that in a few minutes. So this is our chief of service, Dr. Bhattacharya, and he's doing one of our cases. And we did about 4,000 of these cases and, and really showed that it, it worked very well. Static image telepathology was used uh, for uh, some very upscale applications. For example, the University of Pittsburgh uh, runs a transplantation uh, hospital on, in Sicily. And uh, for a number of the years, uh, in the late 90s and up to about 2002, they actually rendered all of their transplant diagnosis by static imaging, worked well. And uh, they reported in 2002 that they had successfully completed about uh, 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 3,000 cases with the diagnostic accuracy of almost 100%. So it's an interesting technology. That's gonna come back in a few minutes because that can be used with dynamic imaging as we'll see in a few minutes. So static image telepathology uh, was started and uh, the real pioneers for that were uh, in uh, France. Uh, we started dynamic robotic telepathology and, and I'm gonna tell you why that was. Now this is a little bit complicated for those of you who are not physicians. Hold on tight for a second. Uh, but this, uh, each of these numbers represents a hospital. One through eight, each of these hospitals is a very, very famous hospital. So number one is the Massachusetts General Hospital. Number two is the Cleveland Clinic and so on and so forth. Number three is Johns Hopkins. And this is looking at for, for patients who have a bladder cancer, urinary bladder cancer. And the question, if we just look at is it benign versus malignant, the diagnostic accuracy is uh, gonna be uh, very high. So we're showing, we're showing error rates on the, on the left not too well pre presented here, but the error rates are generally about three or four or five percent. And notice that this is basically the same for uh, all of these hospitals. But the next, and that's usually as far as the study goes. And that's really what the FDA looks for when they're looking at studies. The problem is that it doesn't match up with clinical uh, medicine. Uh, that's my specialty area. That's just the first phase of looking at a specimen. Now, this is a little more complicated. Look at, let me tell you what, what you're looking at here. So number one is still the Massachusetts General Hospital, and they, for one year, we re-reviewed 186 cases. So the total, so, so that's the number of cases. Number two, 118 uh, hospital, number three, 75 cases that year. And this is the percent uh, accuracy. And again, the uh, numbers over on the side are uh, not well printed out, but the top one actually represents 40%, not 4% and 35% going down the line. And look at this, a major discrepancy would be an error, which means the patient got the wrong therapy. And a minor error, uh, error is uh, less important. And look, look at hospital number six. 
Um, major discrepancies of uh, over 20%, one out of five patients is getting the wrong therapy, because it's based on what's called grading and staging. And grading means how ugly do the cells look to a pathologist, grade one through three, three is really ugly, one is how it looks normal. And then staging is how far did those little cells go? Did they go all the way through the wall of the bladder? Did they get into the lymph nodes? Did they get to the liver? And major discrepancies would mean that the pathologist who put the, uh, the diagnosis out that determine the therapy the patient got, got it wrong up to 20 or 30 percent in hospital six. And, and all of these were reviewed by a national center that uh, I, I happen to be director of. Well, the question, tele, robotic telepathology started to, because we wanted to deal with this problem. And uh, it's an extremely complex story we're not going into today. In some parts of the world today, the technology would be used. But, but that's why robotic, because we discovered that the focus, looking up and down in the microscope, made a big difference in the accuracy of braiding and staging. So that's why it was invented. And this was one of the early uh, systems for robotic microscopy. Now, hybrid means the joining together of two things, two dissimilar things. So you can take robotic telepathology systems and static imaging systems, and you can fuse them into a single system. And that has real advantages because you can find the areas of interest, the so-called regions of interest using robotic microscopy, and then you can take a snap picture of it, take a digital picture of it. And you can both archive that, but it also is usually at higher resolution. So that's where you might actually make the diagnosis. And uh, those systems were introduced uh, in the uh, late uh, 1980s and uh, became uh, very popular. And uh, many of the programs, some of the programs that started then, and you can ask about it later if you're interested, but some of those programs are still existent. They've been in operation almost 30 years and have diagnosed thousands and thousands of patients. It's a little bit clunky because it has a robotic step in it. And any, anytime you're interposing uh, remotely controlled little machines, uh, little motors that are controlling the slide moving around on the microscope stage or, or the focus going up and down. Anytime you introduce those subs, it, it, it adds some extra time. There's some overhead. Uh, it's like anything in telemedicine. It's never as easy as doing it hands-on, but that's fine. It's hard to drive 150 miles. So anyway, this was uh, one of the first uh, major installations. I want to mention it because uh, the guy on the left of the white coat, his name is Dr. Bruce Dunn, and he really is the leader in the United States in robotic uh, static image uh, hybrid uh, telepathology. And as I said, his, his program has now done probably close to 20,000 cases, still in operation. And if you look at the character in the middle with the uh, flag coming out of his head, that's Vice President Al Gore, and he's up in uh, Minnesota giving... Uh, giving uh, Dr. Dunn what's called the hammer award. If you look carefully on that, on that uh, frame, you'll see there's a nice hammer with, uh, with a ribbon. But uh, big event, big events nationally, uh, big success story. Okay, whole slide imaging and whole slide enhanced imaging to move along. Whole slide imaging, as I said, is life static imaging, excepting it's of the entire, entire glass slide. Uh, whole slide image enhanced telepathology. You can take a robotic telepathology system, add a whole slide image component. So you can go around the slide, pick the area you like, pick the, uh, the, the, the focal plane you like, and then press a button and a whole slide image is made of uh, that specimen. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that based on some technology we worked out. And I'm doing it because it gets the idea across of how fast are the scanning times. Although, although today we've moved beyond the technology that I'm going to show, I still think is very uh, illustrative for people who are uh, just learning about telepathology. So this is the basic layout for whole slide digital imaging, which is the preferred way to do telepathology today. Uh, so you have a microscope with a camera and uh, you take the slide image and put it on a client computer server. And then people at different sites can uh, tap into that and can uh, navigate around the slide. And uh, there are thousands of these machines out there that it's estimated that there, in fact, there are now 400 labs that have written papers in the academic literature, which gives you a size of uh, uh, an idea. So fully digitalized slides on a server, and then you pull up on a workstation, generate a telepathology report. And so that's also very convenient because those can be archived. That does not have to be done in real time. 
So this was the idea for uh, for our introduction. We looked at the length of a uh, an optic optical uh, uh, pathway, optical axis, which is uh, 13 or 14 centimeters in a regular microscope. We said, well, what if we were to miniaturize the whole thing, make it the size of you know tiny, tiny little microscopes? Uh, we could uh, here. I, I, there's a miniaturized. So that's the amount that we want to miniaturize. We want to take that whole microscope. And reduce it to down to the size of that little object that's uh, shown in green, and uh, its its optical pathway would be about nine millimeters, so you know one twentieth the size of what you see. Uh, with an ordinary uh, uh, robotic microscopy, if you want to look at a section, you really have to kind of move the microscope, uh, stay uh, the slide on the stage, and look at one picture at a time. And that's not it because if you have a very small field of view and your optical lenses that make up that pathway. But if you were to take, say, and increase the size of that optical field 20 fold or 80 fold, you theoretically could scan the whole slide in one sweep. And uh, so here it uh, shows roughly how that might uh, work, and that's roughly the speed at which it takes place. So you can scan the whole slide and, and take down a gigabyte of information in 15 seconds. Uh, so this was a little lenslet array we made. And here I'm holding it in my hand. It's really cute. So this is made out of uh, plastic, optical plastic, and it's exactly the size of a U.S. quarter. And it's got 80 little lenses that we've carved into this uh, plastic. And uh, the idea is we would take a group of these. This is what it would look like if these were individual little microscopes rather than just lenses in plastic. And we can take three of those sheets, stack them one on another, and we have 80 optical pathways and I'm showing three of them here in these blue uh, blue arrows and this was actually created and uh, the world's record for a scan was actually broken with a set the standard so we we showed we could uh, prepare a whole slide in um, less than a minute instead of the 30 minutes that was the standard at that time and that there are people who would say that was really the big breakthrough in the field but anyway this is how that that little scanner would uh, go over a slide pretty much at this rate there, we're digitizing the slide, and uh, we're taking we're taking uh, information off through the sensor for that uh, slide sensors, the camera sitting on the top, and we're taking it off at uh, two hundred. We're looking at two hundred forty small static images a second. Two hundred forty images are coming off of that a second and being processed into one of these large aggregate images. And uh, we would do that three times, one for green, one for blue, one for red. And we have fantastic images that still are, are regarded as the best in the field. Here's a gallery of the images that we did with that device. And there are a lot of companies now that are making whole slide imagers. Uh, it shows us uh, I'm them here. Okay, well, what are the big problems? What would you think they would be intuitively? Well, sitting within any of these imagers is the equivalent of a light microscope. They still have a stack of lenses. They have an optical pathway. They usually basically gut the parts that are on one of these microscopes and mount them in one of those boxes. They put them in the boxes because then they can charge a lot of money. Um, they don't have to be in those big boxes. But anyway, on an ordinary uh, light microscope, there are objective lenses that have different magnifications, usually 5, 20, 40 oil immersion lens. You know, which one will be used? Do we need multiple lenses? Uh, so that would be one issue. And then this uh, this little part down here is critically important. This is how you focus the thing. Make it go up and down, make the, the stage go up and down, different planes of focus. Because, because, because slides that pathologists look like are not one plane. In fact, if you were to look at them in 10th micron, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter, and if you were looking at them in 10th micron increments, they could be 30 of those or 100 of those that actually make up the full sampling of the sample. And pathologists get very, very fond of uh, doing focusing. If you go down and see them, they look like violinists all day long. Their hands are wobbling back and forth as they're reconstructing in their mind's eye what they're seeing in three dimensions in the slide. And pathologists get very grumpy if you take that away from them. Get really unhappy. So what are the issues? Well, how many lenses go in? What magnifications? And then I'm telling you this because as you get into this, these are questions you have to have uh, asked. And so what are the magnifications? How many lenses? How many uh, different lenses do you want in the system? Do we need? Do we need focus? All of the original whole slide imaging systems had no focus systems. 
And uh, they had no what we call Z axis. That's the axis that's up and down, X and Y or lateral motion. And they had it, they didn't have it. They didn't have it for a number of years. And I think that's one reason that the field got a black eye with the FDA, because they said, well, gosh, our pathology consultants say they use focus all the time. Nobody had done the study. Do you need it? They just did it. And that just had a historical base. So for many, many years, companies would even refuse to talk about that. They were just in massive denial for the first company. It's too cumbersome, took too long. And uh, so that, that became a very large issue. And then types of lenses. Do we need air lenses? In other words, is there air between the lens and the slide? Or are we going to put oil in there? Because that, that helps us in terms of uh, high, high magnification. And that's, that's pretty messy when you're lose, using a robotic system. So these are the issues you want to think about. With the uh, uh, z-axis, how is the microscope focused? Is the person at the far end actually going to change the focus up and down, or is that going to be automated by the machine? Who focuses the microscope? And then what kind of cases are really dependent on having z-axis or focus gap capability? And it's a pretty short list, but there are things that pathologists really wouldn't want to miss. And those have been pretty well uh, categorized now. Okay, let me uh, touch on, uh, on some of the issues. Now we're moving away from how's the microscope built and who's going to put their hands on it and what is somebody procuring one of these things going to want to ask the, uh, the company that's selling it and so forth. What were the big issues? And we just touched on those. Focus, magnification, storage, of course, would be a, a, a big issue. But then there are the legal, regulatory, and reimbursement issues. And... You know, most of these didn't even exist as this equipment was being developed uh, in the year 2000 through 2010 or 1990 through 2000. So HIPAA, of course, I, I'm not going to talk about HIPAA, but everybody knows about that. Everybody knows that there's a HIPAA component to everything you do except breathe. Um, FDA, I put in larger letters because the FDA is, is uh, really a menacing uh, group for the telepathology world. When we started the first uh, company, the FDA wouldn't re respond to our mail. Uh, and the only reason we knew that was that in Washington, a friend of the family worked in the FDA and told us that had the decision that may not to answer the letter. So that's the way that the FDA behaves. If they're not interested in what you're doing or they've decided they don't want to investigate it, they just ignore your mail. Um, and then around uh, a decade later, 1995, 96, they began answering the mail and they said, okay, you'll have to do clinical validation studies. So the first studies they prescribed were that you had to look at 100 cases. And then they began increasing it, not by 100, but by orders of magnitude. So three or four years later, they took it from do 100 cases. Well, why don't you do 1,000 cases? And then they said, eh, we're not comfortable with 1,000 cases. We can't differentiate in 90 6% accuracy from a 95% accuracy. And our statisticians tell us that you need more cases. So they said, so instead of 1,000 cases, why don't you study 10,000 cases? And that became the standard. And at that point, industrial leaders like a G said, geez, let's just do the studies in another country, get their FDA approval, and see if we can get our FDA to replicate that. And there are precedents of that, for example, with uh, handheld uh, ultrasound devices that we might see in a radiology department. So the FDA is, uh, is a hassle, and uh, we think we're probably pretty close to getting it approved by, uh, by the U.S. FDA. It's been approved by the Canadian uh, FDA for over a decade. And we think that every year we say, well, we think we're pretty close. This will be the year, and uh, January 1st comes, and we say, oh, this will be the year, and uh, then another January 1st. Reimbursement, Medicare, Medicaid, private payers, that's, that's another webinar. Uh, only to say that uh, progress is certainly being made. Medi Medicare has paid for pathology and radiology forever. Uh, they regarded it as being comparable to an ordinary service, and uh, our reimbursement has not been a problem with that. Medicaid, that depends on the state. Private payers uh, tend to follow Medicare. So uh, our experience with billing for telepathology has been very positive. We found that the, that the reimbursements are... Uh, timely and the and the arrears are very similar and so I mean it's uh, you know it's, it's not bad parity legislation is a kind of legislation where a state legislature requires third-party payers to pay for telemedicine services and uh, last count there were uh, what 29 uh, states that had passed that legislation we passed a good legislation a couple of bills in Arizona 
you know, you got to do it. You got to go up there. You got to meet people and talk. But it's it's very doable. And then there's a, a license issue where a t- a medicine is now creating what's called a compact. And that's similar to the way that nurses get interstate uh, licensing. And uh, we're making a lot of progress in that area. How many how many uh, states now? 19. 19. Chris Herbs, my expert sitting here and bringing me up to date. So license, uh, compact, we're making progress. So these are good things. The U.S. Congress has a lot of pending and, and, and real legislation that's important in telemedicine. It's really come main stage. You know, you see it in major, major magazines. And uh, so it's, it's getting easier and easier to get a hearing and get the regulatory and the uh, legal issues, statutory issues that we really need. So big progress in those areas. Okay, clinical guidelines and uh, standards. Uh, the uh, American Telemedicine Association is the largest uh, association, in, even internationally, in telemedicine. Uh, I'd encourage you to go to their webpage. They now have, uh, they've done very careful uh, studies and, and published important standards and guidelines based on those studies and meta-analysis. Uh, and the first one, Pathology, came out in 1999. Uh, I had the honor of co-authoring that one. And uh, I recently did an update, 2014. So if you go to the ATA, American Telemedicine Association webpage, you can actually pull up uh, 13 different standards, you know, nursing and, and uh, diabetes, all kinds of things. And one of them is telepathology. They're very well done. They're done with NIST. They're very authoritative. And uh, it's really the place to start. There, there also is an excellent uh, bibliography at the end, carefully put together by experts in the field. I'm just going back to the last slide. And then publications, uh, Laurent Pantanowitz uh, at uh, the University of Pittsburgh is, and Andrew Evan at University of Toronto, they've really published a lot of papers on both standards and guidelines in the United States and then in other countries as well. They're really good. And so I would encourage you, to go to the American Telemedicine Association webpage, and you can download those for free. You don't have to be a member, and it's a tremendous public service. So for those of you who are in other areas of uh, telemedicine and have not uh, done this, I, you know, we really encourage you to do it, and uh, we do it all the time. We really think they're great. So they're, the, they're really the backbone, and when you're dealing with accrediting agencies and so forth or laboratory accreditation agencies, you know, if, you're, if you're doing some of the applications they're gonna mention in a minute uh, and can pull out these guidelines, it really, really carries you a long way. So that's what that looks like. And uh, okay, what are the applications? What can it be used for? Can it be used for, uh, you know, if anybody's not in the United States and listen to this, raise your hand. But I'm gonna think for a moment that, uh, that uh, this is primarily a US audience and, uh, So, you know, what can you do, what can't you do? Well, you can do primary diagnosis as has been done for 20 years in uh, Milwaukee. And you can do primary diagnosis if you have an urgent need. You know, you have a small rural hospital and you really want to move things along and they want to keep the tissue processing there to get get the Part B billing. Or uh, so you want, or I'm sorry, the Part A billing. And uh, so you want to do that. You can do that, but you really, all of those cases, all of those files should be sent to a central pathologist who takes a look at them. How long does it take to verify a slide for, for most pathologists when a primary has all been done? For, for most cases, you know, it's seconds. It's seconds. Five seconds. You know, if it's an acute appendicitis and I look at it, you know, it's a blink. So it's possible to do, but there has to be a reason why a courier is running back and forth. You don't want to put in a limousine and pay a lot of money, right? So you don't want to set, so you really have to have a reason. And uh, there, there will be settings in which that traffic is taken back and forth and put it on the van and send it and it really works. Second opinions are a different thing. Second opinions you can do now and you can get reimbursed for second opinions. So someone diagnoses somebody's cancer of the breast and they would like to have a breast specialist look at it. Uh, you can do that now. And you know, second diagnosis are opinions. They're not definitive diagnosis, they're recommendations. And that is on the radar screen, even in the United States. Uh, Interoperative frozen sections are uh, actually a a very, very good application. They can be done in the United States. Uh, So that's that's, uh, worth taking a look at. There are a number of sites that routinely do that. And some places do it really between their operating room and their pathology lab on the other side of the campus or on the other end of the building because of the convenience. 
Rapid cytologies are important for those of you who are, uh, are pathologists or cytologists or cytopathologists who are actually watching this session. So you'll be familiar with this uh, particular problem. So for example, if, if the surgeon does uh, a, a needle aspirate of a thyroid mass, the question number one is the sample adequate, right? So there'd be some places where a pathologist would go and do that and could make that judgment. But if there's not a pathologist there, still a pathologist has to look at it. And it's very inconvenient to go to the side of a, where a fine needle aspirate, you know, and kill, kill 15 minutes waiting for the patient to get there or for the case to come up or for the whoever. So, you know, you really want to do it after the, uh, immediately after the draw has been done and the slide has been made. And uh, some people are using telepathology to do that. I think it's a very good, very good application. Whereas the diagnosis might be difficult in some cases, certainly telling adequacy of the specimen is uh, more, much more likely to succeed. Well, how do you organize the telemedicine practice? What, what do the things look like? And uh, I'm gonna run a couple, through a couple of uh, models and then go back to the first one, which, uh, which uh, we've used here very extensively. So there's a case triage model. And this is, uh, you know, in brief, where there is a pathologist whose case is coming in and it's being sent to subspecialty pathologists immediately. That's the model used by the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology for many, many years, thousands of cases. The Norwegian model is a model where there is a single location in need of a single service. And that was pioneered in uh, the northern part of Norway. The northernmost medical school in the, in the world is the University of Tromsø. And 240 miles away from Tromsø, uh, right off of Lapland, we used to call it, so to the, uh, the northeast, way north, there are two tiny islands that have little hospitals, a 25 bed and a 35 bed. And the surgeon likes to go there and do his breast biopsies there. And they've been doing breast biopsy for uh, frozen section since 1989, almost 30 years. And it's been very successful. And over the, over the years, really thousands of patients over many years have avoided the need to leave their island to get their breast lesions diagnosed. And so uh, Tor Eide and Ivar uh, um, Nordrum are the two pathologists who set that up. And, they kind of have the world's record now for longevity of service. The German model is what exists at, uh, in Berlin, and so it's joining the very famous Virchow Institute with Charity Hospital, uh, which is some blocks away. And uh, that's a pure frozen section model, and they've been doing 1,000 plus cases a year by a robotic telepathology uh, between those two very high-end sites. I mean, Modern pathology was invented at the Virchow Institute. This goes back into the 19th century. So you couldn't have a more famous, a higher profile institute really using telepathology every day. The Canadian model is very interesting. Uh, Canada, Canada has a real shortage of specialty pathologists. Uh, each province has its own healthcare system. And uh, there were, were some real, you know, Wall Street Journal headline articles about problems, particularly in breast cancer diagnosis because of the lack of access, ready access to breast pathologists. So two of the, uh, two of the uh, uh, provinces, Quebec and Ontario, set up very large, relatively large networks. The one, last time I checked, the one in uh, Ontario had 17 hospitals, but spread out over a vast area. Canada is big. And then uh, in Quebec, uh, I think it was, it's 18 hospitals last report. And they're really doing lots of uh, telepathology and doing it with great care. So those papers are really uh, worth looking at too. Well, the case triage model, I think, uh, brings up some interesting questions that really do need addressing. So the way we structured our practice, we're a relatively small university hospital. Uh, we have, uh, up at the time this study was done, we had fewer than 500 beds. Uh, generally, the rule of thumb in pathology is one hospital for each hundred beds. So the number of specialty pathologists we had, you know, stretching our resources was about 10, but the problem is there are 20 or 20, 20 plus surgical pathologists of specialties. So everybody has to both do their specialty or almost everybody, everybody but the neuropathologist has to uh, do general pathology as well as specialty pathologists. And so, you know, who would we put in that diamond to be a triage pathologist? Should, be, should it be somebody who, who has specialty experts in the case that's coming in from the referring? 
or can they, these people function as general pathologists and be interchangeable? So that really, that really affects our call schedules and so forth. So we really studied that very hard. So we have the triage pathologists. We're looking at their diagnostic accuracy, pulling in all kinds of cases, including all the subspecialties. We're looking at whether they, you know, push the button correctly to send it to a triage pathologist, subspecialty pathologist, when they need one. And they're making that call. It's not the subspecialty pathologist. So we've studied whether they make the right decision. We've studied whether the triage pathologists really thought they had to see that case. So there are two pathways to diagnosis, either directly from the triage pathologist going straight down, or often that arm subspecialty to triage, back to the triage pathologist in the case sign out. And one of the key features here that I'd like you to notice that in either case, it's the triage pathologist who signs the case out because we don't want to confuse our rural sites by introducing them to 20 different pathologists. They go nuts. So we want them always to see uh, the same face, at least within a given week, to see the same face and develop a, a rapport with them. So we send it back to the triage pathologist. And we're very glad we did that. That turned out to be really important in terms of service satisfaction out in the rural hospitals that we were uh, serving for this. Now, I apologize for this uh, little bit complex, the dark lines, there was deferred rate, excluding the pathologist subspecialty. We would expect those to be higher than deferred rate with, within the pathologist subspecialty. We would expect them to defer fewer cases if it was in their specialty. For, for pathologists, who was the GI pathologist, didn't really matter, and just anecdotally, he's our, our He's the leading pathologist in the world for the number of cases that he's looked at. But uh, the soft, soft tissue pathology is pretty interesting because if you exclude uh, that person's subspecialty, they ended up deferring for the, all the other cases, over 21% of the cases. That's pretty expensive because that means two pathologists minimum had to study the case. That's really expensive. You don't get to bill twice. And uh, that person tended to actually defer a fair number of, of, of cases, even within their specialty. Um, and then you see variations on these things. So as you look at these, you, you look at these, and, and, and if we were looking at times, the difference in time looking at a case varies by a, a, a factor of three. You know, one person signing the case out in a minute, and the other three minutes. Boy, if you're signing out 60 cases a day, that really adds up. That's a couple extra hours. So the efficiency of the pathologist, the human factors become a very, very big deal when you're organizing one of these practices, particularly when your pathologists are getting paid on RVUs. You know, they're hitting the cash register every time they hit a billing code. And um, the differences in their salary these days get enormously magnified when you put that RVU filter in, as we, we certainly have here. So that's, uh, that's really something to think about. Now, would that be true in other areas of telemedicine? Of course it's true in other areas of telemedicine. It's nothing unique. Uh, we've looked at dermatologists who take three or four times longer to, to, to read out a slide. So this is part of the, what we would call human factor studies. Uh, where to start finishing up here? Where to start? Well, do it as a hobby. Do it as a hobby. If you're really serious about getting it in your organization, you really need a strategic plan with buy-in uh, all the way to the top of your organization, be like any other service. You have to look at a needs assessment, and that becomes a big issue because, because a lot of this equipment is really expensive, and uh, there is uh, no way to recoup that. There is not a facility fee that pays for the equipment. So you have to be saving money somewhere that offsets the cost of the equipment somewhere down the line. Maybe you're bringing additional hospitals online. Maybe you're avoiding travel to uh, a circuit rider doing frozen sections. Maybe some of your smaller hospitals get to do cases uh, four or five days a week rather than two days because there's a pathologist available. So those leads assessments are very, very important. I've mentioned legal regulatory reimbursement. That would be, of course, factored into any business plan. Pathology, staff, and qualifications. New technologies, you know, early adopters, middle adopters, late adopters comes to play in all these things and then actually generating that business plan. And the thing that I didn't put on this slide, I would go and do a site visit to an institution that's doing this stuff. I, I doubt that anybody who's tuned in here learned about it in medical school, or maybe you did in your residency if you're a pathologist. 
but go see a functional lead, uh, unit. That's really important. And, and, and people in telemedicine are usually uh, very, very willing to have visitors. Leading edge innovations, uh, same day breast clinic. There are a lot of things that are uh, being looked at that could be transformative uh, based on these technologies. We've worked a lot on, on the same day breast clinic where a patient gets a core biopsy and, and uh, is looked at in radiology, uh, need, needs a core biopsy. We do ultra rapid processing. We get the sections within two or three hours. The pathologist can be drawn in from anywhere in our network to read out the section. And so this, uh, this uh, woman had uh, a core biopsy. She, she came at 1115, had a core biopsy at 12 o'clock. And uh, 327, she's looking at an oncologist. And it turned out she had benign disease. And of course, that was an enormous relief to her. So in, in a culture of which things are speeding up and people want convenience and they really, that's being marketed. I don't know, this particular one would be one that would uh, survive and proliferate, although there are a number of hospitals that are doing this now. But the point is there are new ways of looking at how pathology services are distributed. And certainly uh, my friends are with pathologists are very, uh, very eager to be competitive. And the docs like it. This, this was nice. This was one of our very first cases where we did the rapid rest. I believe the program will benefit many people who are unable to travel to a specialist and would like the results in a couple of hours. And then she said, I found the service to be excellent in so many ways. And uh, the quotation, the explanation points are ours. What would those little faces be these days? We'll Google. What? Emojis. Emojis? Emojis. Em emojis. Oh, I got to get updated. Be an emoji. They, they will make my face into an emoji. Okay. Okay, thank you. This was a pleasure to, uh, pleasure to uh, share with you. Obviously, I enjoy uh, this topic very much. I'm ready to take some questions, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Weinstein. So one of the first questions is, um, does the, any of the pathology societies accept or endorse the ATA standards and guidelines? Uh, I don't think that issue has come up. I'm pretty sure that issue has not uh, come up. The one that we you'd want to look at would be the uh, College of American Pathologists. And uh, they're, 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 uh, they, they are a laboratory accreditor. Um, Except, you know, ex except I, uh, and, and endorse, I'm not, uh, I, I have to say I'm not sure. I don't think so. I've been on their committee that would do it, and it hasn't, it hasn't come to my notice. So we hear the terms digital pathology and telepathology. What's the difference? Well, it's a good question. Digital pathology, some institutions love that term. The industry loves that term. Because there's digital radiology and digital pathology, you know, people understand that. But strictly speaking, digital pathology is really an umbrella term for all pathology imaging uh, using a digital format. So those could be images of DNA gels that would fall under that rubric. The automated pap smear uh, devices, readout devices would fit there as well. We like to use the uh, term telepathology to describe applications where a pathologist is actually providing services. Uh, at a distance, the classic definition. And uh, it was interesting because when the ATA was putting together its guidelines, and uh, I, was, I didn't lead that committee, but I was on the committee, and it was really a split vote on what one to call it. But then we said, you know, but if I take it to Congress, they know what telemedicine is. And uh, to them, there's a teledermatology and teleradiology. And so let's keep it in the same family. So uh, I think about it, telepathology is one slice of a pie. Uh, the digital pathology pipe, but it could be a, a big slice someday. Um, <clears throat> another question. As costs go down and primary diagnosis become FDA approved and with the push towards WSI in combination with technology enhanced workflows, do you see liquid biopsies playing a key role in therapy um, efficiency monitoring in the future? Well, I think it's a great question, and I personally think it's a great application. Yeah, and I think I think to get the liquid-based uh, uh, specimens um, into the the flow everywhere is really uh, re really important. So the answer would be yes. So we we heard a lot about um, you know tele telepathology. Um, 
what do you think is the new technologies um, in telepathology? What, what do you think um, is the future? Well, I think there are a number of technologies that have come on the horizon that are proving to be extremely important. Uh, some of these are very obvious. Uh, cloud services have been important in terms of that focus issue I mentioned. Because we used to have to be able to find you know, a small little area, basically one microscopic field, a folk take the, the machine to that point and then do a Z axis. We go up and down and take a series of pictures. We don't have to do that anymore because we can take the entire slide, put it in memory. So for example, uh, Leica sells a system that does uh, 10 micron steps. So for a five, five uh, micron specimen of a very good histopathology specimen, you can actually have 50 sections of the whole thing. So cloud, cloud uh, services were very important. Diagnostic viewers are being uh, developed. Certainly Philips is developing one. They want to have a universal VIP, uh, uh, viewer that can do both radiology and pathology. Uh, probably some of you have noticed, but radiology departments are all changing their names to Department of Medical Imaging. So as we aggregate all of the different uh, kinds of imaging, having, having uh, um, diagnostic viewers that can handle them all will be a very uh, useful. Uh, we need more open access platforms. You know, there's some people I know who are using cell phones uh, to uh, look at residents or looking at the cases and showing them to the uh, staff members on cell phones where they happen to be and they're verifying the diagnosis. So, you know, it's like everything else, cell phones end up being uh, central to what's being done. You mentioned teleradiology, and, and you know it's most radiology is tele these days. Um, with telepathology, does that require a patient's um, informed consent? That's a really good question. Uh, a little bit of a sticky issue. Um, you know, if you're doing an intraoperative frozen section, or if you're going to do one, you know you're going to do one, and somebody's there getting the informed consent for the procedure. And it's pretty easy to say, could you sign on this as well? Informed consent for the frozen section. So. Our attorneys would have us do that routinely. You know, if you're doing primary diagnosis and you're handling tens of thousands of cases, uh, you know, you can't add that extra thing that somebody has to get that. So it can get wrapped into the, uh, to the general informed consent document that the institution has, uh, but that becomes more of a hassle. I, I, I think it, as primary diagnosis comes in place, the informed consent will disappear. And the other question, uh, Chris, is that you know, do you need a modifier on the billing code if it's done by telepathology? And uh, in Arizona, we have 47 uh, third-party payers, and uh, um, all, um, 46 out of 47 said they, well, they don't want modifiers. So, uh, so there are some people that are putting the modifier in, even though the, uh, the uh, fee is the same. Are there any concerns about who is performing gross analysis of a specimen when doing frozen? This has come up at, at their facility when broaching telepathology? Well, I think it, it can be an issue. You need somebody who really is uh, trained. Um, the picture I showed you um, of the ellipse of the skin would be an example where a pathologist at a distance is actually uh, overseeing the grossing. Uh, and I think that's the way to go. The grossing stands, uh, the video grossing stands are not that expensive compared to what the rest of these setup look, looks like. And if I were going to be doing it, if I were going to sign out that frozen, I would want to see the gross. I think it really is an issue. But I think that can be done by video imaging. I don't think you have to be there. Now, of course, you're, you're dependent on whoever is doing it to uh, tell you what it feels like, right? So you want to know, are there firm areas? That may be something that uh, is, uh, comes up. And there are new haptic gloves that are being developed that you can put on. And somebody at that at, at the send end actually has similar gloves, and they feel the specimen, and then your fingers feel exactly what they're feeling. And those are being developed by the uh, Department of Defense. There've been a number of Patrick projects on that. So I think I, I think some of those concerns are going to go away as people get accustomed to using haptic gloves. So when do you feel um, telepathology will be okay for primary diagnosis? Well, I don't know. As I said, I, the FDA is, uh, I'm, I'm sure they're uh, very sincere about the I give them all the accolades in the world. But the fact is we've been waiting 30 years. And um, I, my, my uh, colleagues who stay close to that and have a, a specific interest uh, in that topic uh, really think that it's going to happen within 12 months. So my sense is that, uh, my sense is the FDA is tired of hearing about it. We're just going to exhaust them. Okay. Well. Um... 
I think that's all the questions we have right now. Um, we do have one on um, international telepathology services. Um, you, you touched a little bit about um, the international telepathology services. Let, um, let, let me mention that, even though the hour is a little bit late, Chris, because because there is a great site. There are a lot of international uh, ventures out there, but there is a site that I'd like, if you're really interested in this topic and, and go, taking it further, there's a site called IPATH, small i in the capital letters, PATH. And this was developed at the University of Basel in Switzerland by a colleague named Martin Oberholzer. And uh, this is uh, open source uh, software. There are currently groups, entire groups, that are using that software to create their virtual groups. And uh, currently they have about 150 user groups around the world. Some colleagues of ours in Panama use their service all the time. They love it. And the last time I checked, uh, they, they also have a service that, uh, that uh, people with unknown specimens can send them in and then people can either compete for or can sign up to sign those cases out if they have this specialty expertise. And uh, they've handled over 17,000 cases. So uh, I would check that out. I think it's really interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, again, this presentation has been part of the National Telehealth Resource Center webinar series. The next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, September 15th, and will be presented by the Texas Louisiana Telehealth Resource Center on leveraging t um, telemedicine across a continuum of care. Announcements for this webinar will be sent out. Um, and as always, we value your opinion and we ask you to take a few minutes and complete the online survey um, and the link will be sent to you. Thank you very much and we appreciate your participation today. And thank you, Dr. Weinstein. Bye-bye, thanks, Chris.